Hi all. Welcome to How Open Source is Helping to Save the World, Modeling a Revolution in Open Collaboration and Transparency from Politics to Science. My name is Carl Delamont. I work at CloudBees with the open source community, mostly with Jenkins X, which is a continuous delivery platform on Kubernetes. In this talk, I'll be addressing the many benefits that open source, the open source model, or the open source way, can bring to how we as individual communities around the globe and as a global community address the current pandemic crisis. I will discuss some specific open source projects and initiatives that are working to combat the pandemic. But even beyond these exemplary projects, I want us to consider how open source can be a model for open collaboration and how that model is having a powerful impact during our current crisis. So this talk will first look at the definition of open source software and some open source projects that are being in impactful at combating this crisis. Then we'll open the conversation to the broader impact that open source can have and, that, and is having even beyond the software world. We'll discuss how open source and open source methodologies are currently influencing scientific research and the relationship between governments and citizens, especially regarding government digital services. The open source model is a decentralized approach to software development that encourages open collaboration. The main principle of open source software development is peer production with open source code, designs and documentation freely available to the public. The open source movement in software began as a response to the limitations of proprietary code. And the open source software movement arose to clarify copyright, licensing, domain and consumer issues. And we'll go over some of these open source licenses and even how these licenses are inspiring and influencing the creation of new IP licenses such as the open COVID license. So if you couldn't guess from the title, this is quite a pro open source talk. It is in line with the sentiment and the belief expressed by Tim O'Reilly that generosity is a robust strategy. And he refers to this as the way of life. So although we'll be discussing open source licenses and open source projects, we also want to consider the influence of open source and the open source model more broadly. We can discuss all the topics on this slide, but they ha have all been influenced by and generally are in a relationship with open source. And we'll try and touch on some of them during this talk, such as the open hardware movement, open knowledge, open access, open government, open data, and open standards. So there are many related open movements that have been influenced by open source. And this shows how social and even political views have been affected by the growth of the open source movement. We will look at example open source projects and platforms that have been created to help find pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical ways of managing the impact of the pandemic. And the broader impact of the open source movement and the extent of its role in the development of new information sharing procedures has greatly increased during the current pandemic. The norms and processes of transparency, inclusiveness, and open collaboration that have built up over time in open source are playing a vital role during this crisis. So, a pandemic requires open source sharing. Out of crisis, there goes a flourishing of innovation. And this has been true during major wars and there are always medical, scientific, technological breakthroughs. And it's true during now, during the current pandemic. The extreme nature of this crisis, its severity, its global nature, the rapidity with which it befell us, all this has driven an enormous global response. There's incredible ongoing innovation happening with vaccines, with treatments, research into the virus and how to contain it. And there's an enormous amount of innovation happening in how the research and intellectual property and data that is being generated is shared. Because of the acuity of the crisis, old pa patterns of siloing information, research, and data are being abandoned in favor of greater collaboration and sharing along open source model lines. And these changes are happening rapidly at this time of crisis. And open source and, and its methodologies and processes for working openly um, that have been developed in open source over the past couple decades are having a very positive influence at this time. So making things open will help keep and build public trust. 
And what is being asked of populations around the world at this time is enormous. So gaining and keeping public trust is important in order to enable accurate and timely health information to reach the public. In open source, we have learned the importance of openness, of collaboration, of sharing, and transparency. Often, and traditionally, the incentives against transparency outweigh the incentives for so profit, caution, these reasons. And, but in this time of crisis, there's an opportunity to revolutionize how we are communicating, collaborating, and sharing, and to do so transparently. Open source and an open culture of transparency and collaboration is vital during this time, both for aiding the rapid discovery of medical and non-medical treatments and interventions, and for guarding trust within societies, between governments, their citizens, and medical experts. Transparency may be the most important open source value of all. First, what is open source? Open source is by definition software that is free for anyone to use, modify and distribute. That is in contrast to proprietary or closed source software for who can inspect and alter the source code is limited, often to the original authors. So you can't view the source code, you can't modify it, you can't make derivative works based on that source code and usually there are restrictions on your right to distribute or redistribute the software. So you can see how open source software enables a greater degree of freedom and a greater set of possibilities for collaboration. The Open Source Initiative, the OSI, a nonprofit standards body maintains the open source definition for the good of the open source community. And that open source definition is then used to determine which licenses are open source licenses. The open source definition provided by OSI and linked to in the slides uh, contains the following elements. There must be free redistribution, and the definition disallows the deliberate obfuscation of source code. So that source code must be readily available. Um, and it allows for derived works. So the, the license must allow for modifications uh, to the source code for enabling derived works to be created. And it must allow them to be distributed under the same terms as the license of the original software. The license must not discriminate against persons or groups, uh, fields of endeavor, and it must not be specific to a product or restrict other software, and it must be technology neutral. Uh, open source licenses are licenses that comply with the open source definition. And these licenses that comply with that definition are what guarantee the right to read, redistribute, modify, and use the software freely. So there are many different open source licenses. Common permissive licenses include Apache 2.0 and the MIT license. Permissive licenses are called because they have minimal restrictions on how software can be used, modified, and redistributed. The GNU General Public License or GPL series of licenses are all copyleft licenses, which means that any derived work must be distributed under the same or equivalent terms. Copyleft licenses generally require the reciprocal publication of the source code of any modified versions under the original works copyleft license. Um, and very quickly that becomes what's called like a viral uh, effects on making software and its derived works open source and available, openly available. So permissive licenses, in contrast, do not try and guarantee that modified versions of software will remain free and publicly available generally requiring only that the original copy notice be retained. As a result, derivative works or future versions of permissively licensed software can be released as proprietary software. So the use of open source licenses creates a nexus of trust and understanding what, what your rights are to, with the software and what you can expect of others. And this enables developers, users, corporations, and governments to organize around open source cooperation. And this really points to the power of open source. The OSI's own mission statement states that open source enables a development method for software that harnesses the power of distributed peer review and transparency of process. Open source software is software with source code that anyone can inspect, modify, and enhance. So 
Open source is a term describing a means of developing and distributing software that ensures software is available for use, modification, and redistribution by anyone. And this open source development process is enabled by the distribution and modification of source code. And this engenders open collaboration, communication, and co-design. So anyone can download open source software and use, share, borrow, or change it without restriction, and they can do it together in collaboration. When a programmer wants to make their code reusable, they publish it online under an open source license. Standard practice for that. And if you want your work to be widely distributed and built upon, then the use of a license which enables that is paramount. So people know what their rights are vis-a-vis -vis the work that you've created and put online. And in fact, any type of creative work can be made available for use, modification, and redistribution if it is given the appropriate license or if its license has expired, it will then be in the public domain. For software, we have open source licenses. For creative works, such as writing and multimedia, copyright owners can apply one of the Creative Commons license. So Creative Commons is a nonprofit that helps overcome legal obstacles to the sharing of knowledge and creativity to address the world's pressing challenges. Perfect, that's what we're looking at. <laughs> and the Creative Commons is now stewarding a newly created open COVID license, which is applicable to more than just software. And we will be discussing it in more detail later on. So, um, open source hardware is another example of creative, technical, scientific work being made available for use and sharing. Like the open source software, um, open source hardware is part of an open source culture movement. Open source hardware consists of physical artifacts of technology designed and offered by the open design movement. And open source hardware is being used currently to help build lower cost ventilators and lower cost devices to rapidly swap surfaces to see if the novel coronavirus is present. So these are some examples of how open source, sort of like the open source way and open source norms, um, especially around collaboration and sharing and transparency are being used in novel ways to combat the current pandemic. So by design, open source software licenses promote collaboration and sharing because they permit other people to make modifications to source code and incorporate those changes into their own projects. Open source practices promote software reliability and quality by supporting independent peer review and rapid evolution of source code. Open source is widely seen as one of the best ways to create software because it supports uh, faster feedback and innovation, improves software reliability, drives adoption, and pools technical talent. So you may be attracted to open source software for any of the following reasons. Increased security. Generally, open source projects have rapid turnaround with regard to security patches. Free availability. Online access to software and source code without a large investment in time or money, and the opportunity to modify and improve source code. And these benefits of open source software and open source software development have moved open source from being what started as a fringe activity to the center of software development today. Open source has been hugely beneficial to both developers and non-developers. For example, the internet is built largely on open source technologies like Linux, OS, and the Apache web server. So anyone using the internet is benefiting from open source software. We, we were already in a period of enormous growth in open source software creation. And what's happening now with the current pandemic um, is just expanding even more rapidly. And it's expanding into areas where it was not, uh, it didn't have much of a foothold yet. So open source software had expanded from being more based on enterprise infrastructure, such as databases and operating systems, to being, uh, to occurring almost in every industry, such as FinTech, e-commerce, education, cybersecurity, et cetera. And now it's really um, becoming more of a movement within government digital services. So now we're gonna look at some examples of that. Um, so during the current pandemic, as COVID-19 swept the globe, uh, governments have had to communicate rapidly and effectively with their citizens, providing the latest health information and government policy updates. So government digital services have had to be active and responsive during this pandemic. And in many countries, this has proven critical to the government's response. So new 
government digital services have had to be launched quite rapidly to make health information accessible online, giving people up-to-date information on how to protect themselves and their communities. Similarly, web and mobile self-assessment tools can help reduce the strain on hospitals and medical services. And developing contact tracing solutions is a pillar in many countries' plans for opening society up safely. In this talk, we'll discuss multiple ways and examples of how open source and open source ways of collaborating have facilitated a rapid response to all of these challenges. For example, regional governments have started to battle against COVID-19 by developing open source tools, such as the Government of Ontario's self-assessment tool. As the novel coronavirus began to spread across Canada in March, the local Canadian government of Alberta was quick to create a digital tool to help citizens self-assess their symptoms and thus take pressure off of um, helplines that were getting inundated with uh, questions about symptoms. So within 24 hours of this assessment, self-assessment tool going live, the site had, hit, had had over 300,000 hits and within a month or so had over 3 million. Um, so the Canadian province of Ontario then asked Alberta to share its source code, which they rapidly did. They put it up on GitHub. We have links to the source code for both Ontario and Alberta. Um, and with Alberta's source code, then Ontario was able to rapidly build its own localized version of the self-assessment tool. And the Alber Ontario team was able to iterate on that tool, you know, incorporating more feedback um, and user experience and thus very rapidly create a very nice informative experience for its citizens. So David Eaves and his colleagues at Harvard's Kennedy School have written about this example um, with the Canadian governments and their for provinces and their self-assessment tools. And their summary was that governments should share code more often. This case is a wonderful example of the benefits it can create. Code sharing allowed Ontario to move more quickly. Additionally, posting the code publicly also resulted in helpful feedback from the developer community and wider adoption. In addition, several large private sector organizations have repurposed that code to create similar experiences for their employees. And numerous governments on our, in the, they did like a, a meeting. So on their call, expressed interest in localizing it in their jurisdiction. Sharing can radically increase the impact of a public good. So the movement towards open source and government digital services has been building for some time <clears throat> before the current crisis. And initiatives like Public Money, Public Code, and the Foundation for Public Code are doing an amazing job of helping public administrators understand why their code should be open source. <clears throat> These organizations promote the idea that open source should be an essential requirement in software developed by governments. And one of the primary reasons is that open source results in greater transparency. So code sharing allows good practices and tools to be adopted more widely in days and not weeks. And leveraging existing code allows a government team to focus on user experience, deploying and scaling of the applications. And greater transparency around government digital tools and services is a good both for those who build them and for those who use them. So, Government digital services that are trying to rapidly respond to the current crisis are seeing the benefits of using open source and making their solutions open source. Some more examples of government digital services that are using open source to enable greater speed, collaboration, feedback, and transparency include um, California, it's shared its uh, standard for digital services during a crisis, which there's a link to that on the slide. And there are open source and public resources that are published by government agencies and public sector organizations around the world on open government solutions. These resources can help government agencies at all levels find solutions that have worked for other governments so that they can accelerate their own digital transformation. And it's not just governments that are using open source and sharing their tools via open source. Universities and researchers have open sourced their models that are being used by governments to create and change policy and guidelines in response to our current pandemic. 
The University of Pennsylvania in the United States has come up with an open source tool that estimates the impact of COVID-19 on local communities. Based on that community's population size, hospitalization rates, and whether or when social distancing measures were implemented. Imperial College London's coronavirus modeling has been very influential in guiding the UK government response and their guidelines for physical distancing. And open sourcing of these models enables the research to benefit from all of the goods of open source that we've discussed. So we have fast feedback from colleagues all over the world, reduced duplication of effort, good practices and tools are, um, are able to be adopted more widely and quickly, and transparency. And this transparency is not just towards other researchers who can inspect the code and the models or towards the policymakers who must take the results of the models into account when formulating policy, it's transparency that extends to everyone, including very importantly, uh, the citizens who will be affected by the policy changes engendered by the model's predictions. And this transparency is foundational for engendering trust between all the different people with a very different knowledge and perspective and worries regarding the pandemic. The crisis has created a moment to overcome policy inertia around sharing or adopting open source solutions. And this is true in government digital services, but also with academic and scientific research. And it's true with more than code as well. Okay, so why is open source and the open source way showing so much strength at this time? Because open source enables collaboration so that tools and solutions can be built faster and more efficiently while keeping trust through transparency. So why open source transparency matters? Transparency benefits software development projects in a number of ways. Internally in the project's community, there's a sense of fair play among all the contributors because everything is public. So everyone is accountable. Additionally, because the materials of the project, source code, designs, etc., are public, then we can build on each other's ideas and discoveries. Externally, among third parties, there's a sense of trust in the project because it can be analyzed from multiple perspectives. That is legal, technical, project activity, development processes, etc. This enables us to understand the project or software better, make more effective decisions about it, and enables us to have greater trust in the software or project. So open source transparency creates possibilities for greater collaboration. When we're free to participate, we can enhance each other's work in unanticipated ways, and we can modify what others have shared. We unlock new possibilities. By initiating new projects together, we can solve problems that no one can solve alone. And open source transparency enables greater trust. This is important during the current crisis when adherence to recommendations for any COVID-19 interventions, such as social distancing, lockdowns, homeschooling, homeworking, canceled holidays or vaccinations, they depend on trust. And open sourcing the digital tools, models and policies that are guiding government responses to the pandemic around the world helps build trust into the system. It, it builds it into the relationship between governments and citizens and with the guidelines that are being enacted. So far, we've seen examples of how the movement to open source government digital tools and services has accelerated during the current crisis. And how this growth in open source government digital tools and services can foster greater transparency and trust. This builds very well on the existing movement to increase public access to information. In recognizing the significance of access to information, the UN General Assembly has previously proclaimed that 28th of September is the International Day for Universal Access to Information. And in 2020, the focus for that day was on the right for information in times of crisis and on the advantages of having constitutional, statutory, and or policy guarantees for public access to information to save lives, build trust, and help the formulation of sustainable policies through and beyond the COVID-19 crisis. So in our talk today, we've seen some examples of the ways in which principles derived from open source software development have been applied more broadly to additional domains. 
We've considered the open source software movement as a movement that supports the use of open source licenses for some or all software, and how this is part of a broader notion of open collaboration. One part of this broader collaboration is the idea of access to information for the general public, essentially for everyone. In addition, there are movements around open access to information that are more specific to research, such as the open access movement. And the open access movement is a movement which has commonalities with the open source movement. And members of this movement maintain that academic material should be readily available to provide help with future research, assist in teaching and aid in academic purposes. So open access is a set of principles and a range of practices through which research outputs are distributed online, free, or um, free or without cost, like without access barriers. And during this crisis, many barriers to accessing research have been lowered. As we saw, code being used to model the crisis is being open sourced by universities. In addition, many research journals have lowered their paywalls, especially for research on coronavirus. And similarly, many newspapers have moved coronavirus articles out from behind a paywall. In addition to lowering barriers to access to coronavirus research, academic journals are trying to speed up their publishing schedules to get the research out faster to the scientific community. For example, here is a Lancet article on modeling societal impacts of different government policies under different conditions. However, even with lowering barriers to access and trying to speed up publication schedules, a lot of scientific researchers feel that the process is still too slow and restrictive, especially during a crisis, and are publishing their research on preprint servers, which basically means posting scientific papers online before pre -re peer review and having them be free to the public. Now, this might seem like a great idea, but there are some drawbacks. Peer review is generally seen as a good thing, <laughs> and many scientists believe that it should happen before publication and not after. Nonetheless, because we are in a global crisis, the movement towards more rapid, open publication of information and research has boomed. So intellectual property rights are by definition monopolistic. How then can researchers, charities, and NGOs collaborate with businesses in the, and governments in the development of new technologies to control and eradicate COVID-19? We previously briefly mentioned the Open COVID Pledge. And this project is now led and stewarded by the Creative Commons, the nonprofit that helps overcome legal obstacles to the sharing of knowledge and creativity to address the world's pressing challenges. So the Open COVID Pledge calls on organizations around the world to make their patents and copyrights freely available in the fight against COVID-19 pandemic. And the pledge was developed by the Open COVID Coalition, an international group of scientists, lawyers, um, who seek to accelerate the rapid development and deployment of diagnostics, vaccines, therapeutics, medical equipment, and software solutions. So the companies that decide to make the pledge must make a public announcement to that effect and generally offer a non-exclusive, royalty-free, worldwide, fully paid up license to the pledger's IP solely for the purpose of diagnosing, preventing, containing, or treating COVID-19. And there's some time restrictions to this as well. So it's either the earlier of one year after the WHO, the World Health Organization, declares that COVID-19 pandemic is ended or until January the 1st, 2023. So it's the earlier of those two. <laughs> the Open COVID Pledge accepts three categories of license. So it can be one of several standard open COVID licenses that have been developed by the coalition, or it can be a public uh, open source license that's compatible with the pledge. And this includes uh, the permissive open source licenses, such as the MIT license and Apache 2.0 license. Or it could be a custom license that contains the minimum terms required by the pledge. So as reflected in the above examples, there is some flexibility in the nature and scope of the license that may be used. For companies interested in using IP offered under the pledge, it is important to note that such IP may be covered by a number of different licenses and that each license should be reviewed separately. So 
that all, you know, it's, it's a very uh, good movement in the right direction. Um, obviously, some of the details may, might seem a little bit uh, complicated or needing to be worked out. Um, but it's really more than just about having another IP license or another set of IP license. The Open Covet Pledge and Associated License are part of a whole spirit of how to collaborate on hard problems globally across boundaries of difference, uh, distance, nationality, citizenship, organizational affiliation, um, and, and all these different boundaries that we have within our global society. So the spirit of collaboration and trying to build something greater than any one person, organization, or even national government could build on its own. And the solutions to ameliorate the current health, social, and economic crisis require that level of collaboration. And the open sharing of information and intellectual property certainly helps research progress faster, but it also helps build trust within the wider community. <laughs> um, in the following video, and this is from a Japanese research institute that has been widely shared and freely in the press, um, it's, it's a super computer generated videos on aerosol formation spread under different conditions. And that modeling and associated research that's come out of the Japanese Institute has informed the Japanese government policy response to the pandemic. And by sharing their research results freely, policymakers around the world now have access to that information as do individual citizens when considering their own risk calculations. So it's just one, one example, but this gives you an idea of how we're all being informed by this new open way of sharing research. So we'll watch. Researchers have used the Fugaku supercomputer to model the emission and flow of virus-like particles from infected people in a variety of indoor environments. Air humidity of lower than 30% resulted in more than double the amount of aerosolized particles compared to levels of 60% or higher. As seen in simulations released on Tuesday by research giant Riken and Kobe University. Their findings suggest that the use of humidifiers may help limit infections during times when window ventilation is not possible. The study also indicated that clear face shields are not as effective as tighter fitting face masks in preventing the spread of aerosols. Other findings showed the number of singers in choirs, for example, should be limited and spaced out. There has been a growing consensus among health experts that the COVID-19 virus can be spread through the air. The US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention revised its guidance this month to say the pathogen can linger in the air for hours. So those are incredible simulations. And what's so fascinating is how they are modeling the aerosol spread of the virus, especially indoors with differing levels of mask wearing as well as physical distancing. And sharing research like this has enabled us all to evolve our understanding of the novel coronavirus. There's been a growing consensus among health experts that the COVID-19 virus can be spread through the air. And only in the last month has the US um, CDC or Center for Disease Control revised its guidelines to say that the pathogen can linger in the air. And this research and the way it's been presented here in the videos we've seen is effective for convincing people of the necessity of creating and adhering to physical distancing guidelines and the importance of wearing masks. Importantly, the results of this research have, have been shared not just with the scientific community, but also with policymakers and the wider public, thus influencing uh, policymakers and public opinion. And this open sharing of information helps maintain trust especially during this difficult time and when so much has changed um, so rapidly in people's lives and people are being asked to sacrifice so much. The lead researcher of Rickin research team has said regarding these simulations, quote, people's blind fear or unfounded confidence 
um, against the infection of COVID-19 is simply because it is invisible. That's such a beautiful sentiment because it so clearly expresses why this research is important and why it is important to share the research. Also, it highlights the importance of visibility in enabling understanding in combating blind fear and unfounded confidence. So this is one set of results from one scientific research initiative, but it is part of much of a wider and growing movement to share research. Moreover, as we've seen in response to the coronavirus uh, crisis, researchers are rapidly pivoting to open sourcing their source code and models. And this enables faster feedback, greater collaboration, and sharing of ideas and innovations. It enables researchers to build on each other's work and findings, reduces duplication of effort, and enables greater transparency. So this is actually a title from a recent Wired article. <laughs> and over 40 people who work at the White House recently became infected with coronavirus. And there's a reason to believe the White House was operating with an over-reliance on testing and a lack of adherence to US guidelines on mask wearing and physical distancing. So the US, uh, the White House, is sort of like a small case study on the importance of convincing individuals that it is really important for them to adhere to all guidelines related to the pandemic. And for that, it does help to have trust in the scientific experts whose research is guiding these policies and in the policymakers themselves. Moreover, an epidemiologist at the University of Illinois, Smith, states that testing alone is not actually protective of anybody without a contact tracing and isolation program and without use of masks and distancing to make sure that COVID-19 doesn't spread. And that is because testing is not 100% accurate and is nearly impossible to get 100% real-time testing coverage of all individuals. So it's not a good enough safety net to protect the coronavirus from spreading. The scientific consensus is that contact tracing coupled with testing is necessary to control the spread of the virus by lifting social and physical distancing or lockdowns. Robust contact tracing programs generally consist of a combination of humans doing some tracing and communicating and digital contact tracing apps. Contact tracing apps enable public health authorities to quickly notify people who may have been exposed to a person who has contacted or, con or contracted COVID-19, even if it is someone they don't know, such as if they sat near each other in a restaurant or on public transportation. So there are significant design and policy challenges in these contact apps. There are technical challenges, but also if the apps compromise their citizens' trust, safety, and privacy, or if they are perceived to do so, they won't be adopted widely. And if they are not widely adopted, they won't be effective. The technology exists to make private and secure self-assessment forms and contact tracing apps. The challenge is setting the standards early and driving global adoption of them. So exposure notification has a decentralized reporting, reporting based protocol based on a combination of Bluetooth low energy technology and privacy preserving cryptography. The exposure notification framework has been created by Apple and Google and works with Android and iOS smartphones, and this covers the majority, but not all, of mobile phones. Exposure notification enables implementation of a COVID-19 exposure notification, notification system in a way that safeguards the user's privacy. The ACLU have said that Google and Apple's exposure notification approach appears to mitigate the worst privacy and centralization risks but there's still room for improvement. In addition, these systems can't be effective if people don't trust them. People will only trust these systems if they protect privacy, remain voluntary, and store data on an individual's device and not on a centralized repository. So the exposure notification is an opt-in feature within COVID-19 apps, um, the contact tracing apps and has been developed and published by authorized, and the apps themselves were then developed and published by health authorities. 
which is why we hear of different national or other contact tracing apps being created and whether they are using a decentralized or centralized approach. And the centralized approach tends to mean the user data is deposited in a central repository or database. And a decentralized means that as much as possible, user data is kept on the user's phone. A decentralized approach protects the user's privacy better. And contact tracing apps that have adopted Apple and Google's decentralized exposure notification framework and use that within applications that are open source have had higher levels of user adoption. So Ireland's COVID tracker app, whose privacy statement is shown on the slide, is a fantastic example of open source in the public sector. Its app was installed by around 1 million people in the first 36 hours. And due to its success, the code has been used has the code used to build it has subsequently been given to the Linux Foundation, enabling other regions to emulate the success that Ireland has had. Similarly, Germany's Corona Warn app. Um, in May 2020, the German government asked the software developer SAP and others to build a Corona Warn app based on open source and decentralized technology. The Corona Warn app is a great example of how governments and public administrations can use open source software development to help citizens while simultaneously advancing the technology ecosystem. The app's creation was done rapidly and has been one of the more readily utilized coronavirus contact tracing apps. On its homepage, Corona Warm app states, transparency is a key to both protect the end users and to encourage adoption. For Corona Warm app, transparency has helped adoption. The app has been downloaded by nearly 20 million users. And transparency has been essential to protecting the apps and users and encouraging instant adoption. And open source is a key element of achieving transparency. Open source allows anyone to use, study, share, and improve COVID worn app. Other countries such as France or the UK, they took a more centralized or proprietary approach to building their contact tracing applications have experienced a greater number of technical uh, setbacks and delays, as well as subdued use for adoption. So in a pandemic, speed is critical. When it comes to developing high quality software at speed, using open source is hugely beneficial and even essential. We've seen how rapid government digital services can be created in response to a crisis using open source software. Open source enables digital services to rapidly iterate, gather feedback, share solutions, and collaborate. What's more, the transparency of the process helps us build more, more reliable, secure, and trusted solutions. Rather than spending time building applications from scratch, Open source software enables organizations to harness pre-existing code and iterate on it. Open source fuels collaboration and knowledge sharing, enabling us to produce better technology. During the current coronavirus crisis, the, rapid, um, the development of rapid, excellent technical responses has been hugely beneficial. But these new digital services and tools will not be of any use unless they are actually used and engaged with. It is vital at this time to keep and maintain the public's trust. And I would argue that open source and the open source model has a lot to contribute during this crisis, not just technical solutions built in open source, but the open source values of openness, collaboration, sharing, transparency, and the trust that they engender. During this incredibly difficult time, one of the bright spots has been the amount of technical, scientific, medical innovation that has occurred. And the new processes that are being explored to facilitate that innovation are themselves innovative. And many of them are drawing strongly on open source, the software and the working practices and norms. So open source is having an enormous impact right now beyond software. I encourage all of us to think about how we can use our skills, knowledge, and the experience gained in open source to contribute to the revolution in open initiatives that is occurring globally as part of our response to the pandemic. This moment is important because it is a crisis and also because of the possibilities contained within that crisis. And not all of the possibilities are the open source way. 
Decisions made today could normalize privacy standards that run counter to the values and norms of free liberal societies, undermining freedoms and the public's long-term trust in government. But this moment of crisis is a moment of rapid innovation and change. And we have the opportunity to use the open source tools that we have, including open source values, the open source way, to inform the creation of new social, political, technical, medical tools that are being created right now. And these tools will then shape us and our societies in the future. Thank you for, for listening and watching to this talk. I look forward to speaking with you about uh, initiatives that you've heard about, um, open source initiatives and the open source way that's happening in the world today or initiatives that you're engaged with. Thank you.